close to the end of the day. This is the last, but of course, not at least important session of the day. Actually, it's very important. It's a keynote talk. Um, we selected those last two sessions for keynote because it was, it seems to us as more attractive time slots actually for, for the, because the people are coming from all over the world to this conference. And usually, you know, keynote, keynote talks are at the beginning of after the opening session. But here it's not the case because we selected these as, as a attractive time slots for, uh, which are available for in the working time for uh, people also from North America and from uh, the Europe, Africa and South America. Uh, so uh, the next uh, one presentation will be about the new techniques of assessment and selection at work. And the uh, presenter will be the Professor Adrian Furkan. You will notice a couple of slides I have for his uh, biography because he's very successful and, and popular scientist. So uh, Adrian was educated at the London School of Economics where he obtained a distinction in, in a Master of Science Economy and the Oxford University where he completed a doc doctorate in 1981. And I think uh, he completed actually three different uh, doctorate titles. He got three different doctorate titles in the next 15 years. And he was previously a lecturer in psychology at uh, Pembroke College, Oxford. He uh, was professor of psychology at University of College London, also in some period of his career. And of course, he has lectured widely abroad and held scholarships and visiting professorships at, amongst others, the University of New South Wales, the University of the West Indies, the University of Hong Kong, and the University of uh, KwaZulu-Natal. He has also been a visiting professor at Management and Henley Management College. He's, he has also been made a just professor of management at the Norwegian School of Management. I think she, he's also at the moment there in some employment and honorary professor at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. He's currently the principal psychologist at Stanford Associates. He consults to many organizations in various different sectors, uh, particularly airlines, banks, civil service, and in many different countries, uh, continental Europe, Europe and Asia. He's also an experienced conference speaker doing around a dozen uh, keynote speech a year all over the world. And he has written over 1,300 scientific papers and 85 books, really a lot of scientific outputs. He's an, uh, on the editor of board of a number of international journals as well as a past elected president of the International Society for the Study of Individual Differences. He's also a founder director of Applied Behavioral Research Associates, a psychological consultancy established over 30 years ago. Um, now I'm not going to, to briefly read the, the yeah, abstract of his do. talk. I will just give the word to the Adrian Furham, who will try to present his talk in 35 minutes. Thank you very much uh, in advance for being today with us and uh, the Thank microphone you very much. is yours. Let me share my screen. Oh, wait a minute, what am I doing? There we are. Um, share screen. There we go. There we are. I hope uh, everyone can see and hear me at this point. Um, Everything is perfect. Does excellent. Well. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for the invitation and welcome from a gloomy uh, London. Uh, you know some things about me already. I am an academic and I write books. I can't, um, I've written lots of books. In fact, my next book is being published on Thursday and it relates to the topic I'm talking about. I am a, an enthusiastic writer of books and these are some of the books I've written. But I also go into do uh, business and consulting which is really re very relevant to the things I'm going to talk about today. So these are some of my clients who I deal with uh, in a variety of fields. So the topic I'm going to talk about is new selection techniques. I am a business psychologist. The Americans call us IO psychologists, industrial, organizational. And we're in the business of helping people in the workplace. Selection's a very big topic. There are a number of theories in this area. Some of you might recognize the only good theory, in my view, from the world of vocational psychology 
it's Holland's theory of vocational uh, guidance, and he's got these six different types of people and selecting uh, for them. I'm not going to go into the background. You might do have a more simple theory about some people interested in ideas, some in data, some in people, some in things, whatever. The point I want to make is that there are theories uh, for who to select. I've actually become most interested recently on the topic of select out. I think selection is in, in, the, in, in all jobs is re relatively straightforward. You select the good people and you reject the bad people. Hopefully, we all get this wrong. As we know, the divorce statistics in most Western countries is 50%. So we select a, a mate and we get it wrong. And I think why we get it wrong is that we select in, we look for things we want and we try and find evidence of them. We never select out. In other words, we don't try and find things we don't want. And that's another story, but it's a story uh, around the whole topic of selection. So the question is, as a psychologist in the selection of individuals, um, what other methods we can use? And essentially there's only five types of data that we can use. There's self-report data, what I say about myself. You can ask me questions about myself and I can give them in an interview or I can give them on a questionnaire. I can report on my own behavior. That's one way of getting information. Another way of getting information is what other people say about me. Not me, but my boss, my wife, people who work with me, observer reports on my behavior. A third method is to get my test performance. You could ask me to do an intelligence test, a creativity test. You could try, and if you believe some things are important to select for, you could try and get some behavioral test of that characteristic. You might want to use physiological evidence. It might be that in a few years time, we will be submitting mouth swabs, or you might put me through a PET scan. So you might say, I don't believe what you say. I'm not sure what other people say. I want hard physiological evidence of your behavior. And finally, there's not any of the above, but it's the his my history, my biography. What is my story? Where did I grow up? What sort of childhood did I have? Because the argument is that my background influences who I am. So I think there's no other ways of getting this data. These are the five methods of getting data to be used in a selection decision. Of course, there are always critiques about this data, uh, faking and fibbing. Some people say to me, I never use personality tests because everybody lies. I say, yes, that's probably true, but don't they lie in interviews as well? So some people say any self-report data is bad data because of lying, dissimulation, impression management, call it what you will. What about sex and race discrimination? Some people would say that, you know, we know from interviews that the attractiveness of the candidate has an impact, the accent they have has an impact. So some forms of, of uh, uh, selection are full of potential race, sex, and other forms of discrimination. Some people say it's a very costly business that, you know, it's very costly to hire consultants or to use particular tests. A PET scan will cost you a great deal of money. And others, and I think this is very important, will say, I'm not going to use certain methods because they're invalid. There's no data to prove that they are valid. Now, this is a very noisy slide, but it's at the heart of the business of psychometrics. My talk today is about new techniques in selecting of people. We'll talk about, I've got here a wearable. It could be that I can give you a gamification test. I don't make you sit through an interview. I let you play games. You can go to the web straight after the seminar and scrape a great deal of information from the web on me. These are all ways of getting data. But the scientist in me, the psychometrician in me says that whatever technique you're going to use, we've got to ask some pretty fundamental questions. 
And they fall into these two different categories, validity and reliability. Reliability is does the test measure the, the same characteristic? How well does it measure it? Uh, how stable is the result? If I get a test result today and I get it tomorrow, it would be the same. And the validity, of course, is in a sense more important. Does it measure what it says it's measuring? And I'm not going to go into a long lecture on this. Suffice it to say that from my point of view, you have to demonstrate that your measure, whatever measure you're going to use, has reliability and validity. There are many other things you need to demonstrate as well, but that's the scientific proof. Does the test give a consistent answer? Does it measure what it says it measures? Do the scores on the test predict anything? That's very important indeed. Now in this latest book I've written, I was going to call it 20 ways to assess your lover uh, as from the song, 20 ways to leave your lover, because what I've done is I've looked at 20 different ways of assessing people from astrology, graphology, I'm not gonna go through them all. And what I've tried to ask is, is there an absence of evidence? In other words, do we not have enough data on this method to say whether it's good or bad? Or is there evidence of absence? In other words, we do have data, we know it doesn't work. There'll be very few people, I hope, who will defend astrology or graphology because we've got lots of data on this and we've got lots of data on projective techniques. We've got data, this doesn't work, that these methods, and you see down the bottom, lie detector and voice recognition. The claims for these tests have been tested and they don't work. Then there's the next uh, scale is, 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 there, is it okay as a, as a starting block? And I've tried to give two and three and four Xs to show how good the evidence is. Is it okay? And how good is the evidence? So the question becomes, you choosing a technique to assess an individual, given that what you want is you want to be as accurate, as quick, as cost efficient as possible. What information do you want on an individual, obviously on certain characteristics? Um, and, and the possibility is using these many different uh, techniques. Well, in a book I use quite a lot by a man called Cook, what he's done is he's put down different techniques, as you see on the uh, left hand side, but he's got various criteria. So the one is validity. Does it measure what it says it measures? Cost, how expensive is the test? How practical is it to use the test? Do the test scores generalize to other uh, situations? How acceptable is the technique to the candidate? What would the candidate feel if I said, I'm going to give you, I want a blood sample from you and I want a mouth swab from you in a selection interview? And finally, and this is extremely interesting and very difficult and important, is the legality of the test. So if you're going to use a test to select an individual of a particular type, is this, are you committing a, a crime in your own country? In other words, are you doing something? Are you using information which would be considered to be illegal? So these are very interesting criteria by which to look at a test. Now, over the last 10 or 15 years, there's been a lot of new inventions. I'm gonna talk about gamification. Uh, and this is not using traditional tests, but you sit at your computer and you play a computer game. Um, and the game assesses you for the speed of your reaction and so forth. This is a, a British company, I've worked with them, and they say our most successful partners tend to have customers who are overwhelmed by a large number of applications, huge number of applications. They want to reduce the time and the cost associated with screening the individuals. They want to increase their application to offer conversion rates. They need a clear and fair method to differentiate candidates. They want to focus on diversity and inclusion, and they want an excellent experience for their candidates. Therefore, use gamification. That is their argument. 
It's the argument that this is a technique for assessing people that has many benefits. If you look at the website for lots of people claiming to use new techniques, they say things like this. It's next generation technology. It's 21st generation. In other words, pencil and paper and talking to people at interview are the past. Nobody does that anymore. That's old fashioned. It doesn't work. They say we need techniques that digs deeper, that gets underneath the skin of the individual. They say, oh, our technique is powered by neuroscience. It's state of the art. It's AI. And they flash around these words, claiming that this is the new tomorrow. They also claim it has less adverse effects. In other words, it's less discriminatory and leads to more diverse choices. People are very interested in diversity and in techniques which use this. And it's authentic and real world and disruptive. So there's a lot of people trying to make a lot of money on new ways of assessing people. And it was my job and my task and my interest to say, you know, are they right? Is, are the things they're claiming true? So why would you use new technology, whatever it is? Well, hopefully better predictive validity. In other words, the scores I get from the way I select people predicts their success, their promotability, whatever in due course. Uh, and I reduce the problems of the older methods. Uh, people like the experience of the test. Uh, that the PR, in other words, the, the, the advertising for the company is very important because people know that when you go for a selection interview, particularly if that you are rejected, people that go online and say, this was unfair, I disapproved of this, and companies get worried. People want a good time, effort, financial cost uh, ratio. They want to know that, that how much time and effort I put into it is rewarded and that people are poorly informed how to make choices. And this is a very interesting issue. What I have noticed as a, as a, a researcher is that clients of selection techniques often don't know how to ask the question. They don't know what question to ask of the people selling the particular technique. Well, I'm gonna talk very briefly about five uh, new techniques, what they are, how they're used, how they work, and the evidence of their reliability and validity. And I think this comes under the view of disruptive innovation. I think what has happened when I was a student, we use pencil and paper questionnaires. I've got some in my office here. I still, yes, I still give people uh, questionnaires and they score them pencil and paper tests, they were called. And this was traditionally the way of doing things for until the turn of the millennium. Um, and people, you know, the new entrepreneurs came on board and they said, well, um, this might not be the way of doing things. It's, uh, it might be that we can disrupt this. And now we hear these words, disruptive innovation. And there have been people disrupting the old patterns. I'll talk about them briefly. Led by entrepreneurs, outsiders, risk takers. It's focused on the customer and end user experience. Can I give you a test so that you get an insight into your skills, your personality, your abilities? It's usually the result of new technology, not always, but it re bypasses, replaces, and upgrades the old technology. So the new ways of assessing people are usually new technology, like gamification. It's often, but it's not always revolutionary. And we're in an era where this happens more and more. And this is the sort of pattern in the old days. Interestingly, this morning, I've been working for somebody helping them to develop a psychometric test. And in the old days, it went like this, that the, we, we had these ideas of what to measure and how to measure it. And we had some new, new uh, concepts and we want to measure a person's resilience or we meant to measure their creativity. And what you did is you developed the test and you tested the test. And then you went to a test publisher, traditional publisher, and they agreed and they publicized and printed the test and they sold the test to 
consultants and recruitment people, and the recruitment people used it on the individuals who they uh, were interested in. That has all changed completely in the new disruptive world that, the, uh, that you know go, go straight from the author of the test to the public. You don't need test publishers, you don't need pencil and paper. And it's all really very interesting. I'm not going to go into this in, in any detail, but this is me thinking about the nature of these entrepreneurs, because they are entrepreneurs, and they've gone into the world and they've said, how can we make this, how can we use technology? How can we be 21st century in the way in which we select people? Selection is very, very important. We all know that. We've all made errors. We've all selected the wrong people and it's been painful and costly. So if anyone comes along and says, I can help you in the workplace, even in your personal life, develop a way of getting better information to help you make better decisions, you sit up. So let's talk about some of these uh, techniques. Big data, analytics. There is now a journal of big data. And this is anything that's too large for typical database tools to be able to capture, store, or manage the uh, and analyze. And so it's data mining. As I've said, there have been a number of papers published on this. You can go to the web straight after this. My name has an unusual spelling. There are not many people in the world with my name. I don't think there's anybody with my name. So within minutes, you can get a huge amount of information on me. Is that information on the web? Is that enough? Can you scrape that information off the web to get a good idea of who I am? Is that valuable data? Can you work out if I am an extrovert or an introvert by looking at my presentations, by my YouTube, by what I say about myself, um, on, on various uh, websites. Well, people have done this, and the answer is yes, you can. It's very effortful. It's a great deal of effort to do this, to get the information on me from this particular method, social media analytics. So Twitter, Facebook, picture analysis, textual analysis, you can see what I write, you can see if I make as many errors in my grammar as Mr. Trump. You can see the words I use. You can get an index of my use of vocabulary. You know, I was saying to somebody the other day, I think one relatively good way of getting an insight into a person's intelligence is to listen to their vocabulary. We have a prime minister in England at the moment. He's a very clever man. You might or might not like, like him in his politics. He's very clever. And you can see the way in which he constructs sentences. He's got a rich vocabulary and very, very clever sentence construction. It's a sign of intelligence. I would rate him high on intelligence. So if you want to measure intelligence, if you want to measure introversion, extroversion, if you want to measure neuroticism, you tell me what trait you want to measure. Can I go to the web and scrape things off the web? Well, the answer is people have done this and they've done it and they've shown it's reasonably good. You know, if uh, my picture profile, what data does that give on me? And you, what you do is you get that information, you compare it to other data and you see how accurate it is. I think done carefully, done thoughtfully, it probably is not bad, but it's enormously expensive. How long is it gonna take you to work out whether I, to what extent I'm an introvert or an extrovert. So I think this technique is enormously expensive and not a good idea because it's relatively unreliable. The effort involved, now it might be you're trying to get information about a person who you can't interview, who for all sorts of reasons are hidden. i tell you an interesting example. I was asked to do some analysis of somebody the other day and I couldn't find anything about this person on the web. What they have done is they've closed it all down. That is interesting in and of itself. So the question is, what is out there? Is it me simply showing off, so it's no better than lying in a, an interview, or is it other people have posted the information? The point I want to make is this. 
there is a lot of information on social media on individuals. You can use that, you can scrape and analyze that information and probably get, in some instances, you can probably measure their basic personality reasonably well, but it's very expensive. It's very expensive in terms of time and effort. And I think there are better ways of doing it. Here we are, wearables. I'm wearing a wearable at the moment, smart watches and so forth. They're getting more and more sophisticated. This one tells me to stand up periodically. What if, what if I had in my wearable a chip, which meant that any time I was within one meter of another person also wearing a particular wearable, it would record that as a contact. In other words, that we've been within a certain distance, it's probable we've been talking to one another. So you can see at the end of the day, in the organization, who has been talking to who. You can, in that sense, do a social network analysis from my wearables. You might be wearing a button or a badge, and that badge detects other badge wearers. So at the end of the day, you can download a reasonably sophisticated network analysis. What evidence do we have of that? It can be done. Do we know if it's very accurate? No, we don't. It's a lack of evidence on this topic at the moment. It's a very interesting one, a very interesting idea if you, to look at a person's social network. This network, this watch will might tell me how active I am on the whole. The question is, who can I fake this? Well, I can run up and down the stairs a bit. Who has access to this? We'll worry about this in a moment. Wearables are very exciting. They're an exciting form of data collection. Remember what the, what the job is. We're trying to say, can we use the information generated by this technology to make better selection decisions? We mustn't let the toy drive the science. It's a technique in search of a theory, as somebody said. What do you want to measure? Is this the best way of measuring? It might well be in due course that wearables become very cheap and efficient at measuring some variables that are very important. Up to this point, we don't have the evidence. There are mobile phone logs, of course, logs of calls, text, location, tracking, etc. Um, another very interesting uh, option, another very interesting source of data. What does it tell you? What does it tell you? If you had access to my mobile phone, what do you know about me, about my movements? In other words, what information are you getting? What information are you getting? It's very interesting information. It's very rich information. Is it information which feeds well into a selection decision. That's the point. Digital interviews and resume. So you now have um, not a, uh, an interview, you have a, a digital interview, an interview online. And I will send your resumes. So you then, rather than having an interview, I say you've got five minutes to present yourself to me, to me, the selector, and you can do so by talking about yourself in any particular way. You could probably get some very interesting information. We know um, about what are called thin slices of behavior. Data go back oh, over 20 years now, very interesting. And what it shows is that if you have 10 seconds, yes, 10 seconds of a person talking in front of you, talking to camera, your ratings, of that person's personality and intelligence correlate about 0.2 with their actual personality and intelligence. In other words, you can pick up quite a lot of interesting data. The correlation is 0.2, so you square that and you're getting 4% of the variance, but nevertheless, it isn't particularly bad. Then we have automated personality testing. So people say, oh, uh, you know, using um, uh, pencil and paper is forgotten. And what we need is all our tests online. 
So I have helped develop a, a number of tests, which you do online, and you get really spectacular feedback in a very short period of time. So you do the test and bang, you get a profile with, with uh, graphs and, and uh, data relevant to population norms um, back immediately, no pencil and paper. The question is, is it different if you sit in front of you at home doing a questionnaire on your computer than if you would in a, in a room uh, in front of, of, of individuals? Uh, do people think that they are, do they, do they give more honest answers um, when done this way? Uh, is it more, more accurate than your friend's evaluations of you? Accurate as your spouse who supposedly knows you well? Automatic personality, automated personality testing has come in. It's come in in a big way. You can use little uh, factors. I'm very interested in, for instance, uh, latency of response. In other words, how long you take to respond to each item, which gives me interesting information. So I can gather all sorts of data from you by using an automated personality test. And then we have our friend uh, gamification, which is um, the whole idea of not making people uh, do a, a boring questionnaire, you know, do you like going to parties, but I make you play a game. Uh, some of you might know uh, a game I've used with a, a number of uh, my experiments and my students. It's the balloon game where you pump up a balloon. It's a risk-taking assessment. It tests your taste for risk. It's fun. It doesn't take very long. It's quite exciting and it yields data. So rather than uh, ask you questions, I could give you pictures and you could choose, or you could pay, play computer games. I published a paper recently uh, done in Singapore where we have people's scores on fun computer games and we have their intelligence scores. And we, we've shown that playing computer games can be in certain instances, a reasonable, a reasonable measure of their uh, intelligence. So, where, where do we stand? I think people still want conventional tests. They want, you know, I know from a uh, academic point of view and from a consultant point of view that people, clients are very interested in new science. They're all interested in all the new techniques. And we're in a transition phase at the moment. There are a lot of opportunity. And there are a lot of entrepreneurs, uh, investment capitalists saying, come on, guys, let's get in with this new technology. There's new science, there's AI. Let's use this technology to make the whole business of selection better, quicker, more accurate, more valid, more reliable. I think that's a good idea. But I am a skeptic, not a cynic, a skeptic, because there's some very serious issues. And there are three big elephants in the room. The first is ethics, the ethics of scraping things off the web, the ethics of giving people wearables and sometimes doing things to them without their knowledge. What about selecting older people who are not used to, to the new technology? I think the, the interesting question is, and I know as a scientist having to get through the ethics committee the whole time, is is the organization in the way it collects its data behaving ethically? Can it demonstrate to its shareholders of all sorts that the techniques used are doing all the things they say? They're being honest and they're improving diversity and, and so on and so forth. Ethics, the ethics of the new technologies is an unexplored uh, area. The next one is very important, and it's the validity. You know, it, I, again and again and again, I ask the question, I'm in favor of using a new technology. I think it's great. I approve of exploring and exploiting our science and our progress. All I want from you is the demonstration that the numbers you generate, the output, improves my decision. And it is valid. If you say the lie detector is a, um, a technique 
that if a sex with a, uh, assesses whether people are telling the truth or not, I will say to you, no, it isn't. We know that in 20% of cases, it makes mistakes, errors of omission and errors of commission. Do I get valid data? You know what the problem is? The problem is effort. It takes a long time because you've got to get the data and you've got to relate the data to some criteria data and show that it's valid. And then there's the issue of cost, of the expense of doing things. People will often say the new technology is much more efficient and much cheaper. I'm not sure about that at all. So let me go back to my long slide earlier on about the different techniques. There. Here's the, my conclusion. I think that in the selection, in the use of technology and selection, you can use all sorts of things. Look at number 18, voice recognition. You know, can you use voice recognition to, 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 when somebody's making a claim or you can test their anxiety, you can test whether they're telling the truth or not. Look at blood and saliva samples, extraordinarily interesting. Um, look at some of the uh, new bio data and big data technology. I think I would like to go back to some very simple questions. And the questions are about the validity and the reliability of the technology. So for, for an entrepreneur getting into this world, I strongly approve of you having a go. We've been using old technologies for a long time and they've been reasonably good, some are better than others. But the question you have to demonstrate is the validity and the reliability of the data generation. Is the information which you are collecting from your new technology, can you demonstrate that that data collected ethically is predictive of some characteristics you're looking for? And the problem I think is this, and I have to end now, and the problem is it's very difficult getting criteria data. I'm developing a measure at the moment. I'm very interested in what is called the dark side of personality, personality disorders. I'm interested in why people fail, not why they succeed. And I'm trying to develop a measure with three colleagues. We have developed the test. We feel quite good about the internal reliability and structure of the test. But now we've got to get those test scores and relate them to a criteria saying these scores do predict this over time. It's difficult to, to do that work. It's difficult to get the data. It's not difficult to do, it's difficult to get the data. So final conclusions. I think it's an exciting world, the world of new technology, new ideas to collect data, to collect data, to make better decisions. I think it involves quite a lot of effort to do this, but I encourage anybody to go down that line, warning them that it's not easy. It's not easy to get the data to validate your, your theory or your technology, but I encourage you all. I'm very happy now to take any, any questions or observations from anybody. So, thank you very much. This was really interesting. And I also believe there is some, some place for the techniques in the selection process, of course. But as, as Adrian said, uh, I'm also a little bit skeptic. It can completely replace the, the, you know, the person in that process. Especially because, for instance, in the social network, someone of us is a fan of the social network, someone is not, meaning that uh, uh, if I'm not so active in, in the social networks or, or at the internet, generally speaking, it could mean that uh, my social skills are not so well developed, of course. Yeah. But maybe for some position, it's not so relevant because I can be a guru in some technology. Or, Absolutely. So probably it also depends on the position you're looking for. I mean, yes, absolutely right. Absolutely right. Okay, we, we have one Q and questions in Q&A from the Jan Dvorak. Uh, Adrian, thanks for the great talk. So should a young man ask the blood pressure or some other data on his fiance to run some analytics on it in order to confirm they are a good fit? <laughs> <laughs> so how to, how to select this? your mate? Yeah. Yes, I think that's uh, uh, it's 
I was asked some years ago about um, what's it called, um, uh, fast dating or whatever. You know, I've, I've actually done research in this area about mate selection and that men and women look for different things. Men look for um, uh, attractive women who will make them babies, etc. cetera. Um, I, I tell you what I think about this. I, I think uh, we psychologists, we measure three things. We measure ability, we measure personality, and we measure motivation. I think uh, we get something called assortative mating, what does that mean? It means people of roughly the same attractiveness, the same education, the same background select each other. And that is, is, is uh, common. And that's a good thing, by and large, that we are, we are assortatively mated, that we, you know, tall people marry tall people, clever people marry clever people, etc. cetera. I, I, I think one of the things of, of interest to me, I've done studies on asking people this question. And the one issue that is terribly important is ideology. Do you believe in the same things? It's got to do with religion, it's got to do with politics, it's got to do with eating. You might find a, a person, your, your mate, uh, attractive, intelligent, all those things, but you need to be, quote, on the same page. You need to believe in the same things. Um, you might have some slight variability on some sort of issues. Jung talked about complementarity, introverts and extroverts. But I think if you marry a person of a very different, it's not background, it's belief system. You know, my wife and I never argue about lots of things. We never argue about money. We never argue about politics. We agree with each other. And that I think is very important. So although it's not it, it's relatively easy to measure. It's not difficult to measure a person's ideology because they will talk about it. They will talk about what they believe and what they think is appropriate. And they do, yes, change slightly over time. But to answer your question, it's not the method of measuring it. I think talking, just asking people about their belief system, what they think is important. And I think if you're not on the same page, if you don't believe in the same things, it really, all the others don't count as much. That was the result of a study I published in this paper in Personality and Individual Differences. And I asked people, you know, what they rated in terms of physical attractiveness, intelligence, personality, etc. And it was the belief systems one, which was showed to be the most important in their view, in terms of whether it led to a, a happy uh, relationship. You know, I think what's interesting, as I said, you know, the divorce statistics is very high. We get a lot of data on individuals before we marry them or establish a very long-term relationship. We don't always collect the right data. And my last point is a point I made at the beginning about select out, not select in. I think, you know, what people do in selection is they look for things they want. They never look for things they don't want. They assume that not having enough of what they do want is what they don't want. It's different. For instance, I would, you know, the personality disorders, you've all heard of OCD. You've all heard of psychopath. You've all heard of narcissist. Well, I would caution you in selecting people with these characteristics. And if you understand what a psychopath is and the characteristics of a psychopath and how to measure psychopathy, then you're in the business of selecting out. And often when I've talked about the personality disorders to people, some of them have said, oh my God, now you've explained to me what the problem with my husband is because they've never thought about it in these terms. They've never done the select out. So it's a long answer to a question, but it's a question of, of considerable interest to people. I'll tell you one final story. Frequently when I'm dealing with selection with business people and we're doing some tests, one of them will say to me, can I have an extra copy of that test? And I'll say, sure, you can have an extra copy, but I know why you want an extra copy. And they look guilty and they're gonna give that to their wife or husband to do because they want to see, because they've suddenly got an insight into some characteristic. And so they want to do this. So I think 
we are often blind, we psychologists and scientists, when working with other people, with, with, with our personal lives. But a knowledge of selection and a knowledge of personality is very advantageous to apply to um, our personal lives. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you very much. It's a really interesting response to this <laughs> interesting question whether we can use also the techniques for some other selections in our lives. It seems <laughs> it's possible, but, but always we should take responsibility at the end for our decisions. Yes. How... Yeah, do we have any other questions from the audience? I suppose it's the al almost the end of the day and uh, people are a little bit tired from today. <laughs> A long day. Let, let me say if anyone has a particular question that suddenly occurs to you, I'm very happy uh, to answer it uh, by email. My email is my name, adrian at adrianfernum.com. So I'm easy to find. Uh, it might be, you know, later this evening you think, oh, damn, I wish I'd asked him this. Well, I'm very happy to answer a question. Um, on that particular topic. And as Dra Dragon knows, you are welcome uh, to the slides. So okay. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> okay, thank you very much also for this offer to, to respond to some, I would say, questions offline after the conference. And as I said, this was the, the last uh, session today. I hope to virtually see you tomorrow, some of you at the second day of the conference and after, day after tomorrow at the third day of the conference. Till then, I wish you a pleasurable rest of the day.